Yay! Yay! All right, uh, one more kind of cool thing we can do with these uh, uh, Newton's uh, gravitational laws is um, to try to find what are called Lagrange points. Um, where is maybe a point, uh, if I put a mass, a little m, uh, is there a point I could put it so that it would stay uh, uh, the same, it would stay uh, at the same point relative to the Earth as it goes around the sun? So in other words, what I'm really saying is that, is there a point, actually there is, um, right there inside of Earth's orbit uh, that would have the same period as Earth in its orbit um, so that it would stay in the same position? Uh, that, that would be kind of a useful thing to do. So what we're saying is that the combined action, the combined gravitational pull on this thing from the sun on one side and the earth on the other um, is going to result in sort of a, uh, um, a stable um, or at least a, a point at which uh, it would stay put. That would be a useful place uh, to put satellites, for example, because they would always stay in the same place. Uh, let's see if we can find out where this point might be. Um, Okay, let's go back. Let's do a little scratch work. Um, we know, remember, for this mass, for, for any mass that's going around the sun or, or any other object, remember what we have is something like this. Uh, the, the force of gravity on this thing, g times mm over the distance squared, um, that's got to be equal to mv squared over r, right? The mass, it doesn't matter what that mass is, it goes away. Um, and then, remember we did this too. This is, this is something we're gonna need. What is the speed of this thing around the object? Well, it's gonna be the distance it goes uh, divided by time. So that's gonna be the circumference, two pi r over t. And when you plug this in, uh, what you get is g m, uh, over r squared equals, uh, what would that be? F oops, it'd be a four pi squared uh, times r squared, but there's an r in the denominator, so it's just like regular r over t squared. And then finally, this is what we did before, so I'm kind of going through it quick. The period squared is just four pi squared over gm or q. That was Kepler's third law, we said. Okay, so that's sort of in our scratch work. So that's the period of an object, uh, a distance r away from, uh, let's say, the sun. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. That little mass um, is being acted upon by both the sun and the earth. All right, so let's write down the gravitational force due to the sun. Okay, so that's going to be, my, it's going to the left, right? Being pulled towards the sun, so that's minus g mass of the sun times the little m. Divided by, what's the distance from the sun? Okay, so the way that I have the diagram drawn, um, what is the distance between the sun and that little mass? It's just gonna be the total length r out to the earth minus this thing L. This is the length, uh, this is the distance we're trying to figure out. How far away from the earth might this point be? So we're trying to find L. So the distance to the sun is just gonna be r minus L, right? So this is gonna be r minus L squared. Okay, and then the gravitational force of the Earth on this thing is going to be a plus g mass of the Earth now times m uh, over L squared. That's how far away from the Earth this thing is. Okay, uh, those are the two forces acting, right? And that's going to mean that uh, this thing is going to be, it's circling the sun so what's the direction of the centripetal acceleration of this thing? What's the, the circle around the sun is pointing back at the sun. That's the center of the circular motion, right? So this is going to have a minus sign. And this is going to be mv squared over uh, its distance away from the center. mv squared over uh, the distance, right? And its distance away from the center of the rotation is r minus l. Okay, so far so good. But now, uh, let's plug in some of the stuff that we had done over there uh, as our scratch work. What is the speed of this thing as it goes around? The speed is 2 pi times its distance from the center divided by its period, right? So this is going to be 
minus m uh, v squared. Okay, that's going to be 2 pi. That's going to be squared, right? 4 pi squared times its distance away squared, which is r minus l. r minus l squared. Um, but then there's an r minus l in the denominator, right? So I can get rid of one of those. Um, uh, divided by the t squared. Okay, so let's put the t squared on the bottom. Okay, so far so good. 4 pi squared r minus l over t squared. All right. Uh, oh, and let's just, so I don't have to keep writing it, let's cancel out that m. We don't need that m. Okay, now here is the trick. We said that we want this thing to have the same orbital period as the Earth, right? So it stays in the same relative position. So that t on the bottom is just going to be this. That t squared is just going to be that for the Earth, right? So I'm going to plug in this on the top. I'm still going to have, oops, minus 4 pi squared r minus l. And then on the bottom, that t squared is now going to be for the Earth. It's going to be the period of the Earth. So that's going to be 4 pi squared over gm. So the gm comes up top uh, times r cubed. That is the distance of the Earth away from the sun. OK, uh, so now notice what I can do now is I can chop all the g's off also. And the 4 pi squared goes away. So things become uh, a little bit nicer. OK, let's write down what we've got. So this means that I have minus mass of the sun over r minus l squared plus mass of the earth over l squared equals, OK, what have I got over there on the right? Uh, it looks like I have, oh, this is mass, sorry, this is mass of the sun because that's what the Earth is going around, right? So this is going to be uh, r minus l, still with a minus sign, r minus l times mass of the sun over r cubed. There we go. So that should be uh, what we've got. <clears throat> um, and just for kicks, just because I'm going to clean this up a little bit, let me multiply everyone by a minus 1. It'll just make everything look a little bit cleaner. Boom. Okay. So anyway, switch signs on everybody. All right. Um, now I'm going to use a little calculus trick. And this is called, you may have seen this before in calculus. You may not have. It's a little bit of an advanced trick, but it's just extremely useful. This is called... the binomial approximation. And all it says is this. It says, if I have something, if I can get something in this form, one plus x to the n. x is a small number compared to one. So like maybe a tenth or something like that. This is about equal to one plus nx. It seems really simple, right? It turns out to be just crazy useful in physics because a lot of times you can write things in that form. For example, let's do just a real quick example. What about 1 plus 0.1 squared? Well, that's 1.1 squared, right? So that's for sure exactly equal to 1. I mean, if you just multiply this thing out, 1 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.01, that's 1.21, right? But if you use the approximate formula, all you're going to do is just 1 plus 2 times 0.1, so it's approximately equal to 1.2, which is pretty close. And you don't have to do any of that foiling stuff out. And the nice thing is that it works with any n, and so when n gets big, if it's something to the third or fourth power, that's a lot of terms, right? You remember how to multiply that out. That's a lot of terms you don't have to worry about anymore. And the real magic is that it works for square roots and things too, or things to the negative power, which is really, really useful, which is what we're going to do here. So anyway, if I can get something written in that form, that's going to make things really easy. And here's the deal. Um, 
I'm going to assume, and it's going to turn out to be right, that that point M is going to be way closer to the Earth than it is to the Sun. That kind of makes sense, right? Because the Sun is 300,000 times more massive than the Earth. So it makes sense that that point is probably going to be close to the Earth because uh, the Sun's gravity is so much larger than the Earth's gravity. So that R distance is way, way bigger than L. So compared to R, L is a small quantity. So watch this. Look at that first term in the denominator, r minus l squared. What if I sort of factor out an r? I can make it look like this. If I factor out an r, that's factoring it, it, that's really factoring out an r squared from a thing. I can make it look like this, m s over r squared, one minus l over r squared, right? If you didn't get that step, just multiply r squared back into that thing and you'll see that it still works out. Um, I can leave this one alone, m e over l squared. Uh, and over here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to factor out an r, 1 minus l over r, m s over r cubed. Well, see that cancels out one of the r's over there. Um, it doesn't look obviously like this is going to help us very much, um, but it actually does. Because look, that's one minus, the, the first term over there, that's one minus L over R to the minus two. So what that means is, according to this, oops. Uh, according to this, what I do is I bring that N down inside. This is, let me, re, let me rewrite this. This is M S over R squared, and this is, 1 minus L over R to the minus 2 minus ME over L squared equals MS over R squared 1 minus L over R. Okay, so it looks like that. Um, what I do is, according to the approximation, I can make this really easy just by bringing that minus 2 inside. So that makes it look like this. That's going to be M s over r squared and then this is going to be one plus i bring that minus two inside this is going to make it be uh, one plus uh, two l over r way simpler than trying to multiply that thing out in the denominator right and finding um common factors and all that that, that that's crazy this is much 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 easier uh, minus m e over l squared equals uh, on this side, I'm still going to have my uh, m s over r squared, 1 minus l over r. Cool. Um, oh, look. Look at those factors of 1. m s over r squared is on both sides, multiplied by 1. So that factor and that factor of that thing goes away. Uh, and then I'm going to have, let's see, on the right-hand side, I got m s over r squared times l over, so I got m s l over r cubed. On the left hand side, I have m, I have two of those, two msl over r cubed. Those are just going to combine together. So look, look what I got. I got uh, m, I got three msl over r cubed is equal to this thing that's left over, me over l squared, if I bring it to the other side. Uh, that's pretty neat. And what is it that I'm trying to find? I'm trying to find l. So this is actually pretty easy. Just solve for L. So this means that L cubed, I'll take the cube root, um, is just going to be, a, what? It's just going to be everything else that's uh, inside of there. So it looks like it's going to be ME over 3MS. There we go. Um, so it's this uh, interesting kind of a simple ratio of the masses of the two bodies that are involved. Um, and if you plug in the numbers for the mass of the Earth and mass of the Sun, what you get is, uh, oops, that L is about equal to 0.01 times R. So roughly, 
uh, if you go one hundredth the distance to the sun, that's going to be a stable point. That's the first Lagrange point. Um, that's what four. That's uh, so. L is about equal to or that'd be um, something like one point five times ten to the ninth meters. Uh, something like that. Ten to the six. One one and a half million kilometers. Um, so that's what four times four times farther than the moon. That's a that's the first that's the first stable point. Very cool. Um, is there another one? It turns out, uh, yeah, the other one is really easy to find um, because you could go on this side of the Earth. So this one is called L one. This one is called L two. L one is where they put the solar observatories because you want to have a, sort of an unfettered view of the sun that doesn't change. So a lot of the solar observatories are actually at the L1 Lagrangian point. We like to put uh, space telescopes out at L2. There's a couple already out there, and then the James Webb, the new space telescope, is going out to L2. The reason is because the Earth is almost completely blocking the sun at that point, um, which is cool because then you don't have to worry so much about solar interference. Uh, and the L2 point, the only difference is, if you want to find the L2 point, um, over here where it's r minus l, what you would do is just put in r plus l instead, because that would be the distance out at the l2 point. Uh, if you do that, um, the sign of uh, that force, oh, and the sign of the force due to the earth, right? You, you would change that, and then the sign of the force due to the earth is pointing the opposite direction now, if you're on the other side of the earth. If you do that and solve the equations, it turns out you get the same answer, um, except it's on the other side of the earth. That's neat. So the L1 point and the L2 points are uh, pretty much equidistant from the Earth, one on one side and one on the other. Um, it does turn out this is a more complicated analysis, um, but those are unstable points uh, so that you have to do a little station keeping. If you wander off of those points a little bit, you keep sliding further and further away, sort of like on the top of a hill. Um, so spacecraft that are sent out there have to expend a little bit of energy to stay there. Uh, but it's really cool that those are uh, that those are points uh, that stay relatively the same position with respect to Earth. There are more. There's another one on the other side of the sun called L3. That's basically sort of a mimic of the Earth on the other side of the sun. Uh, some people joke that that's where you would put an alien invasion force, right? Because it's opposite of the sun. You can never see it because it's on the other side of the sun. Um, so far, we don't think anything is there. Um, we wouldn't know, though, would we? Uh, and then there's two other points. There's, there's L4 and L5, and those are a little bit more complicated to find. Also, um, if you make an equilateral triangle, pretend this is an equilateral triangle, uh, L4 and L5 are both ahead of and behind the Earth's orbits, and those are stable equilibria. And those are where you might find uh, like what are called Trojan asteroids. Just um, uh, for Jupiter's orbit, for example, L4 and L5 are regions where uh, asteroids can just sort of collect and sit there because it's sort of a stable equilibrium. It's like being at the bottom of a hill. So if you get close to that point, you'll stay at that point. Um, okay, so this is sort of an interesting application um, using a slightly advanced uh, approximation technique so we don't have to exactly solve the equation, but we can get pretty close using this uh, approximation that you might see in calculus um, to arrive at uh, pretty neat results that there are these... Um, uh, cool stability points uh, when you're talking about two and three body systems.